enjoy the silence. Sports on Patreon. Fuck you. I'm joining. Von Allen Sports. If you're not watching Von Allen Sports, fuck you. This is the man with the most badass name in sports, the Pharaoh. The Egyptian God himself, Amon Ra St. Brown. And on behalf of my man, Vaughn Allen, we want to thank you for your support. Let's fucking go. Vaughn Allen Sports. What is up, guys? How are you guys doing? First time on Thursday night in a long time. I know it's been a while, but um, uh, we have the playoffs coming up this weekend and a lot of news this week that we have to go over. Uh, we also have the semifinals for the quarterback contest um, to see. And Elf of Courage, of course, is back in the quarterfinals for the third tournament in a row. So is anybody going to beat this guy or are you going to let him be the first dynasty of our contest We'll see, but um, we'll, uh, we'll make all those picks uh, later tonight, and we'll go over the Belichick stuff. We'll go over Nick Saban retiring, Pete Carroll stepping down. Um, just, well, that's probably a nice way to say it. I think he got fired, but whatever. Um, and then we got to preview the, uh, the wild card games this weekend. Uh, but before all that, we have a special guest tonight. His name is Brian Tui. He is a very, very well-known author in the realm of sports gambling and sports, uh, um, well, not sports gambling exactly, but sports gambling as it pertains to uh, the sports and the possible rigging behind it. And I don't have an answer for you. That's why he's going to be here tonight to answer our questions that we've been talking about for a while. Um, of course, the very first thing I want to ask him uh, after he tells us a little bit about himself is the grievances that I've had and I've spoken on uh, this show the last couple of years or so. And um, so we'll get to that first. And then around, you know, about 40, 40 minutes into it or something like that, uh, I'll start taking questions from you guys through uh, Rumble Super Chat or Patreon. If you've already got a Patreon subscription, um, remember that you get a free Super Chat. You just send it through Patreon and I'll get it and I'll post it up here and you can ask Brian whatever you like. Okay. So uh, here we go. Brian, how you doing, man? Good. How you doing tonight? Great. So, um, yeah, so, so basically uh, we've, we've been kind of having, we've been struggling with some things been going on in, in the NFL the last few years, uh, specifically the last two years. And, and I want to go over that with you uh, first sure. and foremost, just to get that out of the way. Um, but... Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into doing this? Well, essentially, I was uh, always a sports fan. I grew up a sports fan in a sports-loving family. And uh, I went to film school, actually, in Chicago, and tried to be a screenwriter. And after coming very close to making it as a screenwriter, but never actually succeeding, my wife said, why don't you write a book? And the first kind of book that popped into my head was, Maybe I should do a book about sports conspiracies because I've always heard about certain things that happened in the past in sports history. And it seemed like a subject that no one had ever really delved into. And so that's what I did. I went head first into it. And uh, now I'm basically considered the king of sports conspiracy theories after what's been 14 years now since my first book came out. 
um, I, I got that book back then. And um, that's how I, I knew who you were here. Be, be, uh, uh, the website that you had, thefixesin.net, which I have up here on the center, guys, for you guys to go to after the show. And you can also follow him on X uh, there. I used to follow your website where you would, um, you would go each week. So you'd say week 14 of the 2016 season or whatever year it was. And yeah. you would say you would do a recap and show what happened and why it happened. And then you'd make a prediction for the next week. Um, I, but I noticed you dropped off and you stopped doing that after last year. Or well, I, like that. I, no, I still do it. I did it this year. I did it last year. I, every year I kind of get dragged back into it somehow. But I don't do it as gun ho as I used to, I guess, <laughs> you know, based off of time. And I've been running my website since about 2006. I think the website started three or four years before the first book came out. And after, you know, almost 15, 20 years of doing this, you know, you can only say and write the same thing so often and in so many ways before you kind of like, you know, if people don't get the message by now, what else can I say? You know, here it is. It's in, you know, these four books I have that are based on sports. It's on my website. But there's not much else I can say about this idea about sports, the NFL, the NBA, and all these other leagues manipulating their own games and games being rigged. There's, you know, so after a while, you kind of get tired of it, I guess. Well, I kind of, I kind of know what you mean. So this channel, this channel was built on um, like debunking Tom Brady stuff and Patriots stuff. You know, the, most of the channel here is Tom Brady fans or Patriots fans. And um, I, I made a series called the Brady Hate Saga, where each video would would be based off of some kind of, you know, ridiculous theory about Tom Brady. But over time, I've said so much and just made every point possible, it started to become difficult to come up with something new to say. Because I'm like, what is that? He's got seven Super Bowls. What am I supposed to, t- what am I supposed to say anymore? You know? Yeah. So, well, and that's where, I, that's where yeah. I landed in the same thing, except I mean, a different, you know, angle of it. But yeah, it's the same, same thing. How many different ways can I explain to people that, look, you know, sports are a multi-billion dollar industry. They're part of the show business. And the biggest takeaway, the biggest thing I try to give to people is the, uh, this very true notion that the leagues can legally fix, manipulate their own games. I mean, there's no law that prevents them from doing this. And so if they can do this legally, what's preventing them from manipulating games? And that's the biggest thing I think fans need to realize and think about is that the leagues can legally fix their own games. They could legally manipulate games and there's no ramifications for them. And so if that's the reality of it, you know, Mm -hmm. I guess what it comes down to is you start thinking about, you know, if I talk about corruption in government, or I talk about corruption in big business, or I talk about corruption, you know, in religion or anywhere else, people have no problem. But when you start talking about corruption and manipulation in sports, it really seems to affect them. Because I think so many people think of sports as pure, and it's such an escape for them that they don't want to think about the reality. They don't want to think about this is a multi-billion dollar industry, that they do play the games for money. There's a lot of money involved and a lot of different businesses involved from Nike to NBC to ESPN and Disney and all these other corporations, that yeah. there's a lot of money at stake and you can't just let things happen randomly because there's too much at stake. Regarding um, being, a, being able to rig uh, your own games, w- would that not fall under fraud? No. Uh, uh, Believe it or not, it would not. So think about it this way. That you talked about Tom Brady a lot, apparently. So I remember the whole Spygate incident, right, with the Patriots sure. and everything. Yeah. There was a New York Jets fan who sued the Patriots in the NFL over Spygate. And he was basically suing for 10 years' worth of damages because he was a New York Jets ticket holder. And he basically said, every time my team played the Patriots, we were robbed because they were cheating, they were videotaping signs, they were cheating, winning games, et cetera, et cetera. So the, this case went all the way up to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Right. And that's where it got dismissed. And the judges wrote in the ruling that if you buy a ticket to see an NFL game, all the NFL has to do is put on a football game. As long as they don't put on a basketball game, as long as they put or hockey game or boxing match or whatever, as long as the NFL puts on some semblance of a football game, they fulfilled their obligations to the ticket buyer. So it doesn't mean certain rules have to be applied. It doesn't mean certain players have to be playing. It doesn't mean the game can't be outright fixed. As long as they play a football game, 
they've met their obligation. So there's not even fraud involved. So, I mean, if you're what, if that's the most that protection a ticket buyer has in an NFL game, what does anybody sitting at home have? They have a lot less because they're actually not even spending money to do this. So there is no fraud actually even being committed, even though people, I know a lot of people argue, well, if you, if this was going on, if games are being fixed, well, then you couldn't bet on it because then you could sue them, blah, blah, blah. It's still not the case either because people can bet on professional wrestling in certain areas. In Europe, you can bet on professional wrestling. And if a game is fixed by gamblers, as opposed to like the NFL, you could still bet on it even though the game's fixed because you don't know the outcome. And it's the same with the NFL game. If it's being fixed or manipulated, you still don't know the outcome before you put your money down. It's just like playing a slot machine. That that uh, that case, that particular case you're talking about with the Jets fan, that one's always yep. I've always been interested in that because it's brought up a lot. The thing about it is that well, the Patriots, the I think one of the reasons why it didn't go anywhere or why it didn't get traction is because the Patriots were really only violating the rule for the first half of 2007. So see, before that, it was not a rule. They didn't break a rule. Well, the rule or not. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily a legitimate football game if they were cheating. And I mean, granted, you know, if it wasn't a rule where they really cheating, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is they definitely had an advantage based off the videotaping of coaches and what they were using in terms of their signs and detecting blitzes and that sort of thing. But I think, again, to me, the bigger takeaway is the fact that the circuit court ruled. You're talking about the language. Ticket buyers basically have no, yeah, ticket buyers have no protection. And the, and the interesting thing is, I and I did this, I think it's in, I'm afraid it was in the season in the Abyss book or the Fix is Still In, but I went through all the different lawsuits that fans have brought up against leagues, and some of it includes like Formula One races and that sort of thing, and fans have always lost. There's never been really a case where fans have beaten the league or a team when they've sued them over, you know, like the Cleveland Browns moving to Baltimore, or yeah, moving to Baltimore, or Indianapolis leaving town, you know. All those, or Baltimore going to Indianapolis, I should say, all those sort of cases, the fans have never won. They've never beaten the leagues. Yeah, the the Cleveland fans weren't able to um, keep the Browns, but they were at least able to sue for the Browns' name and the Browns' team the and the Brown legacy. I wish the Houston, I wish the Houston people did that for the Oilers, because when I was a kid, my favorite team was the Oilers. So. I was heartbroken when they moved, you know. Um, yeah, I'd rather but, see new others out there than the Texans, but yeah, yeah, thing. exactly. It, it just has a it has a cool ring to it. Just you know, Houston Oilers. That's just the way it is. But uh, um, but yeah, with Baltimore, they just up and met, let, left in the middle of the night, and nothing was. You're right about that. So that's that's strange. Um, why why would why would okay why would a team cheat though if it's rigged? Like, how is it rigged? Like, what is the process involved well, with the NFL? There's, NFL. There's, okay, if you stick with the NFL, there's a variety of ways you could do things. Okay, so, I mean, I approach game fixing from two angles. One is from the gambling angle, and one is from the league fixing their own games for entertainment purposes. Right. Because there's kind of two different ways of doing things, if, but they both can kind of operate the same way. I mean, I spoke to a couple of gamblers, and they basic one guy told me, he goes, if you gave me a quarterback – an offensive lineman and a defensive back on a team, I could give you any game you want. I could rig any game you wanted with just those three players out there, three of the 22 on a team. Because the quarterback obviously can control a lot, the offensive lineman can control a lot, and defensive gotcha. back can give up plays. And I honestly think you could almost fix a game with just one of them if you just had the quarterback, or even if you just had an offensive lineman. Offensive lineman doesn't block like he's supposed to. He holds at particular times. He can derail an entire offense just on his own. So... I got it. That's one way of doing it is you get players on on it. But I think the main way the NFL manipulates its games today is through officiating. Because so many calls are subjective and so many calls yeah. are, you know, applied willy nilly that I think it's very easy for the league to say, hey, look, even if they don't want necessarily, like, you know, the Patriots to beat the Jets this week, if they just want to keep a game close into the fourth quarter so people keep watching all the way until the end. A yeah. few calls here or there, a few holding calls, a defensive pass interference here, and that can totally change the outcome of a game. It can t turn on a dime just based off of one call. You know, a team's rolling on a long extended drive, and all of a sudden they get a holding call against them. Well, now they're back. They were first to 10. Now they're first to 20. That changes the game plan. It changes what call plays get called. 
instead of maybe scoring a touchdown or they're trying to field goal, if they miss a field goal, now they come away with no points, all based off of that one flag. And I think that's the way the NFL does it because, you know, there's been plenty of egregiously bad calls in the NFL, especially in the past 10 years. And you it's hear worse. no yeah. sort of punishment. Yeah, and you hear, you never hear about officials being punished, right? You ever hear no. about an official being suspended for a bad call, being fined for a bad call, no. being you know kicked out of the league for a bad? No, it never happens. I mean, now they don't get the prime you know choice of playoff games, but still, you know, there's really no repercussions for them, and they don't even face the media. They don't even face media scrutiny. There's what is it? One guy gets to enter the room and interview the one head referee after a game. Is that what it is? There's a three guys. I forget how many. Yeah. journalists actually get to talk to the referee after the game, but it's very minimal. There's very little exposure for that. And the NFL protects them, you know, defends them in many ways, but no, you know, the journalists in many ways, aren't going to do anything it about it. Open. Yeah. No. And so that's the thing. I think that's the easiest way for the leagues to manipulate games, but I think there's other ways you can do it as well. I mean, through head coaching, through play calling, through the players, I mean, all of it. I mean, you think it, think of the, uh, whatchamacall, um, the NBA and game tanking. You know, there's game tanking in the NBA. We know it's proven to be taking oh, place. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, how does that absolutely. happen? Well, it's the owner basically telling the GM who conveys it down to the head coach who conveys it to the players that we don't want to win. Mark Cuban admitted this. Yeah. And yet, there you go. Those are fixed games. Nobody calls them fixed games, but that's essentially what it is. Yeah, Philadelphia 76ers, they, they called it the process. And... Oops. Yeah, one second. Sure. Yeah, I can see everything right here. Hold so. on. Okay. My headphones just died. <laughs> no, Give no worries. A second. No worries Sorry. at all. No worries at all. Just let me know when you're back. I find my other ones. Okay, guys. We'll. Uh, I'll talk to you yeah, guys uh, hey. while uh, he's out stepping out for a second. Um, yeah, so, so I think what I'm going to, uh, ask, ask him next is about the reps. Cause that's the reps is what I'm interested in. Yeah. Right. I don't really believe that the players get too involved, not with the kind of money that they're making right now. Um, I think the the refs, but who are the refs serving? Are they serving themselves? Or are they serving, you know, an owner or, or whatever? And I think that's what we need to ask him. Uh, okay, you back, bud? Yeah, sorry about that. Thought no I had those problem things at all. Up. Apparently, apparently they were not. No problem at all. All right. Um, okay, so, so yeah, so when I said that the last few year, last couple of years, not just me, but people you know that are subscribed here have had some concerns. Um, it really all started with the Rams. So I live here in LA. So we're you know we have a lot of people that we know that either work around in the Inglewood, the SoFi, you know, stadium, uh, do yeah. certain business th dealings with them and, um, and some political connections. Okay. And based off the information that we were getting, I was very suspicious of the Rams before the season started. So I was going here on my show for 2022. Now, you know, nobody really thought much of the Rams um, you know, overtaking like the Chiefs or even the Buccaneers, you know, something like that. Yeah. But I was very suspicious of them. And then before the Super Bowl, I may I called my shot. I said, I said, the Bengals are going to win the Super Bowl until the very end. And then there's going to be a, a holding call that's going to give it to the Rams and that's going to put it away. That's exactly well, what I happened. Precisely what happened. My friend looked yeah. at me and goes, how the f did you do that? How did you know? I said, I've been preaching this on the show every week. It's, 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 it's set up for the Rams because the stadium, the situation with the stadium is what we know is that even the governor, Gavin Newsom, was involved with this. All of the shopping and all of the real estate that was built around it, all of it is connected to SoFi, but it was connected to getting that Super Bowl here. At the same time, Stan Kroenke, who owns the Rams, was in deep shit with the league and with the city of St. Louis. And... Yeah. He needed to get out of that somehow because he had to take the, uh, the fine on himself because he lied to the NFL because actually the Raiders were supposed to come here. But he yeah. lied and said that he had a deal with St. Louis and he didn't. But anyway, the point is, is that 
I had prior information, good information that told me that they were going to win the Super Bowl. And they did just like that. And now look this year. And uh, uh, let's see, that was uh, 2021. They, they won the Super Bowl, right? I said 2022, but last year I they sucked. So, yeah. yeah, last year they sucked. And then this year they barely got in. You know, they're like, yeah. you know. So well, and, and uh, do you know anything about that? Do you know anything? About the yeah. Well, I agree with you because I think like suspicion with the Rams for me were raised right away when they made the Matthew Stafford trade. Because all of a sudden the whole media mm. was like, oh, you know, they got this Hall of Fame quarterback in Matt Stafford now on yeah. the Rams. I was like, wait, he was never a Hall of Fame quarterback when he was on the Lions. No. Nobody ever referred to him as that. Never. Nobody referred to him as ever. Like, oh, he's a great quarterback. No, yeah. I mean, he was just Matt Stafford. He's just, he's good. You know, he's got a strong arm. But I mean, just the way the media presented that trade was like wait a second there's something weird and like you said then you go on to the business dealings with the rams how they left st louis everything that was tied in together to me i agree with you it seemed like it was telegraphed from the beginning of the season that the whole and i think i even wrote it on my website the way you were broadcasting on your show is that it was telegraphed almost from the beginning that the rams were a real thing and that they were going somewhere and like you said too that super bowl the way that ended it was like there was no penalties in that whole game. And then, like I talk about, the way the NFL can manipulate games. Then at the end, all of a sudden, flag, flag, flag. It was almost like they just pushed the Rams into the end zone to get that game-winning score. I yeah, mean, and then, and then uh, so after that Rams Super Bowl, um, my post-game show was, I remember it so well. My post-game show was devastating because I knew. I knew. I knew something was wrong. I knew it. And I couldn't ignore it anymore. You know how you like know something's wrong and, and you let it, you kind of just hope that it just goes away. And I remember doing that show. I was just so just deflated by that. Not, not, I didn't care who won. I don't like the Bengals either. I don't give a flying crap if the Bengals win and the Rams win, whatever. You yeah. know, I'm in LA, so the Rams win, hey, whatever. You know, um, I just knew what happened. But it's how it happened. Yeah. And how it happened. Exactly. Yeah. It's how it happened. The very next the season, part. they did the same shit for the Chiefs. Against yeah. the Bengals, first of all, in the AFC Championship game, and then against Philadelphia. That, that Super Bowl last February, that whole game, they did not call anything, any ticky-tack fouls, no holding, offensive holding calls, or any, anything like that. Not even close until the very end when Mahomes needed that field goal to kick, and that put the game away. So Philadelphia yeah. couldn't touch the football anymore. Um, and unfortunately, I have to say that I called that one too. And that's two years in a row now. That's two Super Bowls in a row that the referees decided. So I'm going to ask you this. Yeah. I know from your book that you investigated a lot of details about the FBI. Like you did your research. You did your stuff, right? Um, yeah. What would it fix the NFL? Would it not? Okay, it wouldn't fix um, completely. But would it? What kind of positive would it be if we had an athletic commission? that ran the referees each state where there's an nfl team has an athletic a state athletic commission kind of like boxing and ufc would that improve the situation from what you know of no, no? <laughs> to be honest i mean it's, it's probably a good suggestion but i mean here's the thing is again you're dealing with a multi-billion dollar sport right yeah. i mean the nfl's worth what i mean in revenue they make 10 11 billion dollars a year now or something like that yeah i don't even know where it's at but with that kind of money there's gonna be someone's hand in the cookie jar regardless i mean you think about like you mentioned with having a boxing commission or a fight commission to, you know for ufc fights and that sort of thing boxing matches and ufc fights are fixed all the time all the time so having those commissions doesn't prevent it from happening having a horse racing commission doesn't stop horse races from being fixed they're fixed all the time but aren't those I mean, fighting no, those fights though good. sorry sorry go ahead sorry go, no go ahead oh, oh i was just going to say the the the, the fights you have seen stuff aren't they usually fixed through the fighters themselves and not the referees true but even so it doesn't mean you know even if you have an outside independent commission sending its officials to nfl games that doesn't mean that the nfl won't control the you know commission or well, see that that's that's what I'm that's what I'm that saying. Sort of thing. And I mean, that's, right, right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you okay. might be right, but okay. Because because here, my thinking process was this: the NFL does not allow us to scrutinize them, like you were saying. 
They uh, were not allowed to interview them. See, I know in the UFC, I don't know if you follow UFC much, but Dana White, the, the guy who runs UFC, they allow the fighters and every, everybody's allowed to criticize the ref and like point a mic, put a microscope on a stupid ref who didn't do his job. And most of those refs don't like the heat. They, it's too much smoke for them. So they always try to do a good job. If we could just interview these reporters, I mean, uh, have the reporters interview the refs and we can talk to them or see who they are and they have to actually be under a microscope when they do stupid shit like that. I mean, I, always, I thought an athletic commission would provide that, but the NFL punishing, you know, the Chiefs got fined a few weeks back. Now, the Chiefs were in the wrong, okay? Uh, about the, the the refs called a, a correct play. The NFL has been talking about the being uh, in the neutral zone for the offense all year long. They've been calling yeah. that all year, but they shouldn't have been fined for it. I, I think you're allowed to to air your grievances, and when you when they do that, they've got absolute control. How can we believe anything mm -hmm. if they've got absolute control and you can't question them? Imagine a government like that. What would that be called? What would we call a government where you can't question any politician or criticize anybody? What would we call that? Current politicians. <laughs> Current government. We'd I call mean, it tyranny, right? Not, We'd call it yeah, tyranny. Well, and, okay. but, so, but you're, yeah. part of the issue, too, I think that you're even missing is that the journalists are in on it, too. Because the journalists, you know, journalism, sports journalism in the 60s and 70s is totally different from what we have today. Totally way different. different, way different. And I mean, they're all, and the problem is, is if you start asking the hard questions, whether it's to a coach or to an athlete, whoever, well, you don't get to talk to the refs, but if you start asking the tough questions, they'll kick you out. They'll bar oh, yeah. you from the locker room. They'll, yeah. they'll prevent you from being able to do your job. So all these guys who are the beat writers, the guys who are cover the team, et cetera, et cetera, they're not gonna ask the hard questions. And that's why every player in the leagues is a nice guy. He's super sweet. Oh, he's a great teammate. Everybody loves him. You know, you get the same story about every single player in the league, every single head coach in the league. But you know, nobody tells the truth. Like, hey, this guy's a total jerk. This guy, everybody yeah. hates this guy. It doesn't matter. These, I mean, you never hear that sort of thing because nobody asked those questions and nobody reported even if they got that answer. Yeah. So you have that self censorship on the journalist end for sports media, and then on top of it, you don't have. The transparency that you should have and like you said it allows the nfl to run the league any way it wants and i think you know one of the things the nfl could do which would be great transparency wise is when they have a call that's being you know instant replay and they stop the game and they do their whole huddle up and whatever why don't they broadcast what the referee and you know nfl home office are saying to each other why can't we listen in on that because that would be compelling television wouldn't it be that's true to hear it would be great TV. rules and what's going on and yes. that would be transparency because then you'd hear him say, well, you know, I think this, I think that. Well, the rule says this, blah, blah, blah. But we don't hear it. So who's to say the NFL's not telling the guys, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. I know that guy looks in bounds, but we can't have him be in bounds because we need the other team to come back. So he's out of bounds. So that's what we're going to rule, right? Yeah, that's what we're going to rule on. That's what they go and tell us. You know, that, that's, that's such a simple concept, and I never even thought about it. Why don't, why aren't we, why don't we get to listen to the deliberation on these things what's there to yeah. hide what's exactly. and, and and my god that would be that would be the kind of television that would bring in people too like that would that, that would bring in other people you know just to want to know what's going yeah. on and, and that kind of thing and and why can't we listen to the refs when they're huddled on the field you know how they huddle up and then they throw the flag yeah. and they decide to throw the flag what are they saying to each other what exactly is going on there um yeah i i would always like to know what that is if um, if the NFL is rigging it, though, do you, do you really think it's due to gambling and not just them wanting to steer a certain team or uh, promote a player or create a dynasty? Or I mean, would bet would betting really matter to them? I mean, I don't believe it does. I know a lot of people disagree with me on this point, uh, but I believe what the NFL does in terms of manipulating games is one, like I say, to keep a lot of, especially prime time games or the featured games, close matchups until at least the fourth quarter, if not to the very, you know, final play basically of the game. I think there's a lot of that going on for the NFL. But I think more than, more than anything, if they're steering leagues, I mean, I don't think they get together like at the beginning of the season and say, except maybe in the Rams case, 
that you know this team's going to win the Super Bowl this year. You know, I don't think they do that. Even and they even poke fun at it, right? They had their little you know ad at the beginning of the year where they sat around and had the table read with the script about how yeah. this season's going to play out and that sort of thing. They're kind of mocking people like me, which I think has them worried because otherwise they wouldn't actually even do a commercial like that in sure. the first place. Sure. But I think uh, more than anything, what the NFL will do is if they see certain players emerge, like CJ, CJ Stroud, if they see certain teams emerge, certain storylines emerge, then they'll push those. They'll gently massage, if you will, through their officiating to make sure those storylines last longer than maybe they should and get certain teams like the Texans into the playoffs while other teams who are less interesting are kept, kept out of the playoffs to keep those storylines going because that's what makes television you know compelling that's what makes people want to tune in and watch that's where all the advertising money is and that's where their bread is buttered so i think that's more of what the nfl and all their other leagues are doing is they're just manipulating things just enough i don't think they're outright fixing every game of the week make it professional wrestling because they don't right right to. right but i think certain things they push i mean you know again and you watch things i remember a couple of years back when the green bay packers almost went undefeated they went like 15 and one and I was doing research on penalties at the times, the Packers had 11 games where they never had offensive holding called on them. 11 games with zero offensive holding calls. Are you serious? I mean, that's insane. That's un Yeah, it's unheard of, but that's what happened. Now, if you have a guy like Aaron Rodgers coming out there who's a star player who can, you know, only Aaron Rodgers can do certain things. You no, know, not every quarterback can be like Aaron Rodgers. He is a talented player. Sure. But if you tell the officials, look, we want to protect this guy, you know, make sure that he's protected. Then you let holding go. Well, then he's the line's going to block better. He's going to have more time to make plays. And guess what? The Packers are going to win more games. It's just that simple. And that's the way the NBA did things for a long time with Jordan, Kobe, and LeBron. You know, put a bubble around this guy because you can't follow him. Or even if you breathe on him wrong, he's going to the line to shoot two. You give him that bubble, he's going to perform better. He's going to score more. He's going to be more of a superstar. And they're going to win more games. And they're going to get into the playoffs and to the finals more often because of that bubble. And I think the same thing happens in the NFL. They create a bubble around certain players, especially quarterbacks, and it allows them to perform better. Yeah, they, they definitely are doing that for Mahomes right now. Like if you push him out of bounds or something. See, when a quarterback runs, um, that's a big risk. That's why quarterbacks don't usually run. Because when you yeah. run out of the pocket, the pocket is designed to keep the quarterback safe. They want you, you're supposed to stay there. But if you run out of it, you're a runner now. But they, have, they give the quarterback the same rules as if he's in the pocket when he's out of the pocket. It makes no, yeah. well, not all quarterbacks, but some quarterbacks. Well, and that's the thing. If, if Mahomes is running Newton. out of the sidelines, you're supposed to knock his ass out if you want. He's a running back, dude. But they don't let you yeah. do that. Go ahead. No. Well, like you say, look at Cam Newton. Look at how many times Cam Newton just got his head beat in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on plays and the referees never cared. And then other quarterbacks, like you say, you breathe on them wrong, you touch them wrong, oh, it's a 15-yard penalty. I mean, it's a very subjective thing, and it's a rule that has never been applied evenly across the league. It only seems to be applied at certain times and with certain quarterbacks, and it's usually those star quarterbacks, those guys like Mahomes, who kind of always got the benefit of the doubt, and they always give them that extra 15 yards and protected them more than other quarterbacks. Yeah, that's interesting. It seems like the um, historically the bigger quarterbacks, the guys who are harder to sack, they they tend to let more go on against them. It's like mm -hmm. um, they let Ben Roethlisberger get lit up all the time, you know. But if it yeah, was Tom, if it was Tom or Peyton or Drew. You're not as you're not as able to hit them because everyone knows Ben. It takes a lot to knock Ben down. Cam was the same way. Way too big to knock down. I mean, Cam is as big as a linebacker and bigger in yeah, some cases. Um, and then you had uh, Gronkowski. So with uh, Rob Gronkowski, you could ride him literally like a horse. You could just be on top. Might as well just start riding him like a bull. <laughs> And no, no flag, you know, but other tight ends, you touch them and then they throw a flag like, you know, because Gronk was impossible to knock over. What that tells me is that tells me that they are making exceptions based on what people say. And that right there is a form of rigging, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, I would agree. It, Gronk should not be any different. He's a man. They're all men out there. I don't give a shit how big and strong Gronk is or how big Roethlisberger is or Cam Newton. They're all dudes out there. And the rules apply the same, is my opinion. But that is a form of 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I mean, and how many times have you watched a game where you even hear the announcer, whoever the broadcaster, say, "Boy, they're really letting them play out there." Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What yeah. does that mean? What does that mean? It means yeah. they're not enforcing the rules, mm -hmm. right? So if they're not enforcing the rules, the referees aren't doing their job, then what are they doing? And then, you know, you'll have a game where they're really letting them play. And then all of a sudden in the fourth quarter, somebody gets pass interference for 50 yards on a bomb because he touched a guy. And then it's like, well, all of a sudden now they're enforcing the rules. It's amazing how this penalty was let go. The pass interference was let go for three quarters, but now late in the fourth quarter, oh, pass interference matters. And so now we're going to enforce it. And so, I mean, that's why I think fans are upset at the NFL and the way things are officiated, because I know these objective penalties, and you can't necessarily call a holding on every play. But sure. at the same time, if you don't call holding for three and a half quarters and you suddenly call it in the fourth, well, why are you doing it now? Because it definitely seems like you're helping Team A over Team B. And Team A is the one who has the storyline attached to it. It's amazing how all that worked out for the league, isn't it? Yeah, it doesn't help that th this last Super Bowl, you've got Andy Reid um, uh, playing his old team, uh, getting revenge on the Eagles. Then you've got the Kelsey brothers on both sides. What are, what are the odds, right? It's just kind of, yeah. kind of strange. I mean, I even, I even thought it was weird how the Harbaugh brothers ended up coaching each other that year. That, that, was, that was bizarre, you know? Um, well, like I, just, I was thinking about, weekend. yeah, it's just... Go ahead. I mean, what do you got? You got Terry Kill going against his old team. Yeah, right? that's right. You got Mike McCarthy coaching against his old team. <laughs> that's right. You got Holy basically crap. Houston and the Browns with the Deshaun Watson thing, even though he's not playing. And then there's, uh, what was the other weird one? Um, what was the fourth? There was a fourth one. I can't remember the coincidence in the fourth one. But I mean, there's just some oddities that make for instant stories that just, you know, luck of the draw for the NFL. That's what happens. But they can they can Is work. They really can luck? yeah. They, who knows? Yeah, they could work anything. Yeah. I remember in your book. Um, this is not a criticism. This is actually more of a question. I noticed that most of the the research um, and the the issues in the NFL were from the 1980s or previous. Has there any been any new developments with like FBI investigations and things of that oh. nature that you were talking about? Well, with the FBI stuff, no. Okay. Um, because the FBI information was, <laughs> well, here's the story on that. So the government, the federal government passed a law called the Sports Bribery Act in 1964. And that came out of basically all the game fixing that was going on in college basketball at the time, because it was destroying college basketball because so many games were being fixed. So they passed this law that says, and it's really simple. It's like four sentences long. And it basically says you cannot bribe an athlete, a coach, or a referee to alter the outcome of a game. But the key word there is bribe. So like in the case when we're talking like with the NFL, and if the NFL is telling its referees, hey, we want you to officiate this game in that way, they're not bribing anybody, which is why they're not breaking any laws when they do manipulate games in this fashion. It's not a bribe. But anyway, so they passed this law in 1964. Now, because it was a federal law, it basically became the FBI's jurisdiction. So the FBI knew nothing about sports gambling or sports really at the time, because it's actually evident in the files. And so they started building up a network of informants, of bookies, and that sort of thing to start investigating and looking for this new crime of sports bribery. And they found all kinds of evidence. They found evidence in the NBA, college basketball, college football, boxing, the NFL, Major League Baseball, all these leagues that say we've never had a game fixed. The FBI found all kinds of evidence from all different sports that games have been fixed all over the place. The problem was for the FBI is they couldn't get enough evidence to get an arrest, lead to conviction, and that sort of thing. So the FBI, though they were trying, and they would get very credible information from very credible people, they couldn't get anybody arrested because they couldn't get things like wiretaps and stuff that they needed. Right. So after a period of about 20 years or so, as the war on drugs became a big thing in the 1980s, the FBI quit. They stopped looking for this stuff. They don't even actively now look for this stuff. Nobody looks for this stuff, Why? especially on the gambling end of things. Because nobody cares. I mean, the FBI, like you say, the FBI will investigate it if it literally falls into their lap. So like the Tim Donahue thing, when that blew up in the NBA, mm -hmm. the only reason that blew up 
it was partially because of the FBI, because the FBI was wiretapping somebody, I think, in a, I think it was a Gambino crime family, who just happened to say, oh, by the way, we have an NBA ref in our back pocket right now. That's how they connected the to him? Uh-huh, yeah. That's how it started. It was an accident. That's how it blew up. Yeah, a pure accident, 100%. Otherwise, he'd Jesus still be in the right now. That, yeah, that means that yes, he would have been. He would. He would have. He would have been rigging games for twenty years. Yeah. Right. Right now, he'd still. I okay. I didn't even I know that. I, I I thought that there was an investigation because of people were suspicious because of the L.A. Sacramento, you know, oh, Western Conference Finals. No. I didn't know that, man. Seriously, I. Yeah. I, I thought that was a scheme that they caught on to. I didn't know that that was an accident. That's not good. Your accident. No. So, the, that, like I said, the FBI doesn't look for this stuff. In fact, the stuff that has come up, I mean, like Boston College way back in the 80s, I oh, was at University of Toledo, University of San Diego, all that literally fell into the FBI's lap on accident. They were doing other investigations and happened to stumble into this thing. But they literally, right now, do no active investigation looking for the stuff. They don't care. So the FBI doesn't care. We know journalists don't care because they're not doing any investigative reporting, especially guys from ESPN and these other networks that literally fund the NBA and the NFL and give them, you know, carte blanche to do anything. The leagues don't want to investigate this stuff. I mean, you had enough with, was it Calvin Ridley, you know, uh, the guy Williams from the Lions and some of these other guys who were kind yeah. of busted gambling. How much investigation did the NFL really do on that? None. <laughs> Not really. Again, that fell into their laps. But they don't want to be busting guys left and right for gambling because that's going to affect the integrity and the appearance of the league. Sure. And, you know, so if you, the media is not looking for it, the league's not looking for it, the FBI is not looking for it, who, who's looking for it? Well, like you are saying earlier. It, nobody's going to find it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? uh, that's true. I mean, like you are saying earlier, the journalists don't do their jobs. Um, it's funnily enough, I've been complaining about this on this show for a few years, but not in relation to this topic, more in just me just complaining in general. But I've been complaining about the journalist in New England never questioning Belichick over anything. They, they, they're afraid of him. They were like afraid of him. They wouldn't, after the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 52, when he benched Malcolm Butler. I'm sorry, but as, as fans, they have a right to know. Why the hell did you do that? Why did you do that? Like, like even though the, the, never, the Eagles were destroying you, you know, the journalists didn't even uh, keep pushing for an answer. They just let him win, you know? I don't it, think, and I don't think they've ever, have they ever really said why he did that? Nope. Right? I mean, he was their number one mm -hmm. guy, and day of the game, nope. no, he's not playing. He's and, and he was dressed, too. Wasn't he fully dressed? He was and there, and... I, I, I am not one of those people that's saying, oh, we would have won had, had uh, Malcolm been in there. I don't know that, okay? But I do know that the guys that were in were getting smoked. And you put in Malcolm Butler in the second half. He's fresh. He's in there. Who knows what happens, right? Um, all it took was one stop in Super Bowl 49 to make the difference. So, um, but the thing about that was that it was a psychological disadvantage for the Patriots because Malcolm Butler was on the sidelines during the national anthem, very upset. The other defensive yeah. backs were with him and upset for him. And that, you know, you, you, these guys go to war together, so to speak, you know, by taking Malcolm out the way Belichick did screwed with their heads, you know? So he didn't yeah. do what was best for the team or best for the organization, which he always preaches, but yet the, the journalists never, drilled him on this if i worked in boston that would be my question every week for the next 10 freaking years until i got my answer it, it yeah. could be week it could be week 13 of 2021 i'd say why did you bitch malcolm butler okay we'll try it next week then just yeah why why, why don't they do that i mean I, well again because if they kept harassing them then they'd be barred from the locker room and they'd never get to and how is that allowed game. though i mean that's what i'm saying like why is that allowed that doesn't that defeats the purpose of journalism yeah well they don't yeah. want journalism well. they just want you know they can have ai bots now really write reviews of the games and what happened i mean they really don't even need sports journalists anymore but like i said the way it used to be in the 60s and 70s and whatnot was way different than it is today i mean at least you know, if you look at some of those old stuff Howard Cosell used to do, it was a little 
it was more investigative. It was a little more hard hitting. Yeah. It wasn't a hundred percent maybe where it should have been, but it was way better than it is today, which is all just, you know, kissing up to the league, kissing up to the teams, kissing up to the players and coaches. Well, e- even when I was a kid, it, there, there were, um, you know, I grew up in the eighties. I, I was born in 1980. So I was, I watched, you know, Montana and all the way to the present. And I remember journalists getting in fights like, cuss fights and stuff with with players and 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 coaches and that was in the 80s and 90s um yeah i i, I we don't if you notice that we don't get any um sound bites anymore those famous uh, back and forth like dennis green and and bill parcells and all that we don't even get that anymore because the journalists no. aren't doing anything to to piss off the coach um because no, they're afraid you, so is it possible are you saying that the journalists may be connected to everything is well, I, I think they're useful idiots. Oh, right? yeah. Okay. I mean, because they'll, that makes sense. they'll do whatever you want. They'll write whatever yeah. you want. You'll tell them what to do, and they'll do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what it boils down to. That's, and now, too, what I think yeah. it's sad, too, is they're, you know, all the journalists are becoming, you know, armchair gamblers. So now you're starting to watch, you know, sports coverage, no matter what league it is. And instead of talking about, you know, the players or the strategy or whatever, it's all in relation to, well, what's the betting line? Who, you know, what's the over-under? You know, how many yards is he going to have tonight for your fantasy team? And that's yeah. what it seems to be more about. It's like angling the coverage away from, even more away from any sort of journalism towards basically trying to suck money out of people because they can basically have a sports book in their home and then their lap with their phone watching it all on television unfold. And that's what it seems to be geared towards. I find frightening. Because gambling is such an addiction for so many people, and it's so bad for especially young men, you know, 18, 19, 20-year-olds who can bet and gamble and that sort of thing. And it's just going to suck away so much money and yeah. so much out of people's lives. But that's what they're guaranteed because everybody's going to make money on it. Everybody on the other end is going to make money on it. Yeah, yeah I've, got, I've, I've got a script I wrote. I haven't done the video yet, but um, it's, a, it's a video dedicated to, to gambling on NFL. And it's basically me going over... If you're going to bet, here's the safest things, you know, like tips to do. Like, like um, there's one part uh, in the script where I basically say, I want you to close your eyes and picture how much money could you take out of your wallet right now and flush it down the toilet and it wouldn't matter at all. Like your life wouldn't change a bit. It's like Lent. T- that amount is how much you can bet, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, and, and you've got to think of it that way. Um, yeah. I, I really think that's going to be a good, you know, uh, video because people are going to bet no matter what. So, oh, they have forever. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, so, it's, you know, and I and I predicted, you know, when back in the day I said, you know, the NFL, the NFL was one of the leaguing proponents against legalized sports gambling in the United States. They were always against it, always against it, and I said, you know, eventually they're going to lose because there's no reason that Nevada has this monopoly on legalized sports game in the United right. States. It's going to, you know, spread. And I said, as soon as that happens, the NFL is going to do a complete 180 and 100% embrace gambling because it's going to help them. It's going to make people more interested watchers. They're going to watch more games that should not matter because they're going to have bets on it or they're going to have fantasy players in it. And they're just going to fully embrace it and try to suck as much money out of it because it's a new revenue stream for them. And that's exactly what happened. As soon as that law passed, New Jersey won its case in the Supreme Court. It was wide open, and the NFL and the rest of the leagues fell right in line and went from being we're 100% against gambling to, hey, let's bet. Bring it on. When you were on the Dan Patrick show um, several years ago, I can't remember exactly when it was. But I you, can't remember either. <laughs> you, um, uh, you told Dan that you think it would be better if gambling was legalized. Why mm-hmm. did you say that? Yeah. But, well, my own personal belief is I think we should be free in this country to really be free and do mm-hmm. what we want to do. And I don't think, you know, there's anything wrong with people gambling on sports if that's what they want to do. I don't know why it was prohibited. And I think it should be, you know, free and legal for people to do. But at the same time, I was hoping, because in Europe, for example, where there is legalized sports gambling, there is outside oversight over the sports leagues there is some investigation into what goes on because many times, you know, around the world, there have been game fixing scandals that have been 
blown wide open all over the place, you know, in soccer, in cricket, in rugby, in badminton, and all tennis. these other sports all around the world, tennis, especially tennis, there's been, you know, game fixing scandals all over the place. People have mm-hmm. been arrested for it, thrown in jail for it. I mean, like the, you know, Serie A soccer league in Italy is incredibly corrupt from top to bottom. Yeah. The Indian Premier League in cricket in India, which is like their NFL, is inc- same thing, incredibly yeah. corrupt from top to it's bottom. Bad. I mean, all of it. It's a crime all over the world except the United States. And that's because we have really no oversight. Like I mentioned earlier, no one cares about this. But I was hoping that when it became legalized, somebody would care and start looking into it. Because, again, in Europe, that's what they do. When they see suspicious betting patterns, it's reported to the officials. The officials go to the authorities. The authorities investigate it. And lo and behold, look, it leads to actual crimes that were committed and people get arrested and thrown in jail for it. But the United States, nothing. How, how how can you have a team? And the NFL said they would never have a team in Las Vegas. They always said that. <laughs> and they moved yep. the Raiders to Vegas. How do you have a team in Las Vegas? And at the same time, your refs are, uh, are above scrutiny of any kind. That seems to be a massive contradiction and a conflict of interest, and, to be honest. But well, nobody, that's the, the way the NFL yeah. works, right? I mean, it's, it's same, like I said, that's part of the 180 that they did on gambling. They went from completely anti-gambling to, like you say, throwing a team. Every league's now throwing a team in Las Vegas because they know it's a huge draw. I mean, Major League mm-hmm. the A's are going to move there now in Major League Baseball. Everybody's going to Oakland have, A's. All the major sports, yeah. All four major teams, all fit, four major sports will have a team in Vegas soon enough. I'm sure. I mean, the NBA's not there yet, but they will. They got a uh, WNBA team there. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Um, I was going to ask you about. Um, in 1963, uh, President Kennedy signed um, some kind of uh, document for the NFL, some kind of antitrust document. Are you familiar with that? That that gave them. You're going to ask me questions about it? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I mean, I can't. I, I can't. I, I, I know what you're talking to, what you're alluding to, but I, it's been so long since I researched that I. That that's what I was going to ask you. I, I don't know much about it. I just I've heard about it recently, but I'm not really clear yeah. on what that means or how that helped the NFL. Someone was saying that it it made it to where the NFL, you know, could it do allowed, what it wants. If I but if I remember right, basically what it allowed the NFL to do was um, sell their basically the broadcast rights for all their for the entire league as a package. I mean, it helped really birth the modern NFL. Because I think up until that point, all the um, independent, all the individual teams would just have local broadcast rights. Like you know, the Chicago Bears would sell their broadcast rights to a Chicago radio station or television station, and right. that was it. And I think what Kennedy did was he allowed it where the NFL could sell it as a package, and that's what became you know NFL on CBS, NFL on NBC, et cetera, et cetera. And that brought in a lot of money for the league, but it also I think completely changed the way the league was looked at because it went from really almost in that era from being a sport to being a television show. And now it's reality TV, you know, times 10. That's true to a certain extent it is. I mean, um, it's a shame too. The, the, you know, sports are so important to American culture. That is, I mean, we all grew up on it. You did too. You know, um, who was your team? Packers, I'm assuming, since you have a Wisconsin oh God, accent. No. no? <laughs> yeah, I am in Wisconsin, but I hate the Packers. No, I was born and raised in Illinois, and my dad was a Bear oh. fan. So actually, I was I was taught to hate the Packers. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, I married a Packer fan. So. <laughs> oh really? Is she still yeah. one? Is she still oh, watches yeah. football? How does she feel yeah, about you? I mean, like, you yeah, know, it's weird because she, it, she, she doesn't think I'm nuts. I mean, she's still married to me. <laughs> but, but what I, I mean, think, yeah, what I, I mean think, is like, how is the, um, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like if she's still a fan of watching, how does she oh, yeah. sit with you? And are you sitting there like picking the game apart or are you just yeah. being cool? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, all it right. kind of ticks her off every once in a while. All right. But she That's... also knows that I hate the Packers. So I never want to see the Packers win. So it's, it can be fun. Well, the reason I asked that is because about 10 years ago, uh, uh, I met, uh, when I first met Milena here, who run, she's the showrunner, she's sitting next to me, but she's running all the other stuff behind the scenes, but uh, uh, she was just getting into football, 
and then she was mad about something that happened. Uh, Peyton Manning's team won against somebody. I can't remember, but she goes, uh, you know, it's all rigged, right? And I said, what? And, and, and she's like, yeah, with that much money on the line, everything's rigged. Now, the reason where she's coming from is she grew up in a communist country in Bulgaria and Eastern Europe. So uh, I thought I, I, I passed it off as, oh, you just think everything is rigged because of where you're from. Right. But it's like, huh? No, she knew. Hmm. <laughs> she, she knew. What were you talking about well, exactly? Well, like I say, I mean, and that's the thing is, if we were talking about Google or if we were talking about Facebook or we were talking about McDonald's or we were talking about Exxon, if we were yeah. talking about any other major business, nobody would have a problem with this. Everybody would say, well, I'm 100% sure that business is corrupt. I'm sure what you're saying about them doing this illegally or this quasi legally is 100% true. But if you say it's the NFL or if you say it's the NBA, People also, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. See, it's sports. You can't, no, see, that doesn't happen in sports. No, not sports. And I think it's, it's because people are so connected to it and it's such an escape for them. It's like learning Santa Claus is fake. And it's upsetting because you put it, this belief it is. and you put a part of your mind into this because you listen to sports radio. And people would talk like, the, I'm sure right now with the Patriots, if you just turned on Boston Sports Radio, people would be calling and saying, we need to find a new head coach like, Bill Belichick, we need to hire this guy. We need to do that. You're not on the team. Don't say we. But that's part of the mental thing. Because sure. they always say we because they're so connected to it. And that's the thing. And that's why I think it upsets people. And that's why I think a lot of people say I ruin sports for them. Because I just tell them, hey, think about it like it's a big business. What big business, if it could control something, wouldn't control it? Especially if it's going to make them more money. And that's what the NFL can do. They can control these games. They can manipulate these games to get outcomes and results that they want that are going to make more games interesting. So you tune in next week to watch and the following week to watch again and watch all the way through into the Super Bowl, which is the biggest television show in the United States, if not one of the biggest ones in the world. And That's you true. think it all just happens by happy accident. I don't think that's the case. So you don't think every single thing is rigged to the T. You think that just things are massaged sometimes mm -hmm. for yeah yeah I don't, well, think, that, I don't think the nfl is professional wrestling and people argue with me on that they'll say yeah. well they fix every game they don't need to fix every game they don't you know? i agree with that uh, that's what i was going to say yeah, i mean yeah. i just think and i think if you did it you know if it was like you know a circus act where each team was performing certain acts to get certain you you would kind of see through it and i mean i think there are occasions when you see things that are like well that's really suspect because you see some of the effort some of the players give on certain plays and you're like, wow, were you even trying to tackle that guy? Were you even trying to run that down? Were you even trying to catch that ball? You know, you do see certain things where they're really not given much effort, but I think you would notice it if it was all 100% staged. So I think that's what I mean. It's just a certain trick that they have in their back pocket that they pull out, but I think it's something the NFL has been pulling out of their pocket more and more often lately. Yeah, things have gotten worse. Um, I don't. I don't know if it if if COVID was directly related to why things have gotten worse, but it seemed like a, after COVID they realized, wow, we can still make as much money and we don't even need people in the stands. It's it's, it's like it's like they, they they woke up and realized, holy crap, we rule. We we can do anything. And it seemed yeah. like it if that that was like the opening to because everything was being violated during COVID. So why not? Why can't we do it? You know, why can't we yeah. do it? So it, it, I, I just felt like and everything seemed to come together um, right after that. It was just a very strange, a very strange thing. But um, uh, well, I remember I remember reading Ted Turner what back when he owned the uh, Braves in baseball. Yeah. He said something to the effect of. Basically, he almost predicted. He said, I could see a certain point in time where we don't need fans in the stands anymore, where we would even pay people to come see our games to just be part of the atmosphere because he, we don't need the fans. Everybody's watching at home. While everybody's, everything's coming through the television. We don't need them in the stadiums, but we'll pay them to come in just for the atmosphere so it looks like something's you know, more exciting than it is. Like a... Uh... Like a TV, like the TV show Friends, when you have the the audience yeah, the laughing and, audience. Yeah, and exactly. clapping. Yeah, when, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. That's what he. Yeah, that's what he's basically that's, saying. 
That's messed up, man. That, 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 <laughs> and I that mean, was that... probably 40 years ago. But he was right. Okay, so um, we're going to move to some questions from the audience. Sure. Um, uh, so, guys, if you want to send a question, you can uh, send a super chat through Rumble. The link is in the, the chat there on YouTube. Or if you're a patron on Patreon, you already get one free super chat per episode um, with your membership. So don't forget to use that. So either send it on Patreon or Rumble, and, uh, and I'll post it here for Brian. Um, our first one is from Nefertiti. It's a $10 super chat. Thank you, uh, from Rumble. She says, hi, Brian. What are some of the most shocking to fans what are the most shocking ways the leagues manipulate games? Curious, as someone who has not read your books. Well, I think, and I can't prove it, so let's start there. But I think what's very possible, which a lot of people wouldn't consider, is the drug testing policies in all these major sports. Because the idea is that the leagues are randomly testing athletes to make uh -huh. sure that the games are clean. Mm -hmm. I don't think the owners care one bit whether the games are clean or not. I think the Barry Bonds thing back in the day made them sort of care just because and Major League Baseball fans got so in a, bent out of shape when the home run records got broken by a guy who was obviously using steroids and nobody seemed to really report on it then. But I think what's very possible is you could have a player test positive for some sort of drug, whether it's a performance enhancing drug or some sort of street drug like cocaine or heroin or whatever. And what that happens is, is the league determines, you know, when the tests take place, who collects the samples, what drugs are tested for, and then the leagues get all the results. Now, the leagues don't have to make anything public, but I think what they could very well do is they could find a player who's on performance enhancing drugs or someone who's on cocaine or what have you, and they could approach them and say, hey, look, we got this, you know, positive drug test in our hand. Do you want us to make this public? Do you want to suspend you for four games? Or do you want to play ball for us? So how about next week you don't do so well in your game and we make this positive test disappear and then we're all good. <laughs> and I think that it's very likely that it happens because it's amazing. I remember being told back in the day a few, I don't know, probably five, six years ago by actually an NFL reporter, oddly enough, he said that HGH was used widely by probably 70 to 80% of NFL players, but that wasn't being tested for yet. Yeah. As soon as it was tested for, amazingly, no one ever got busted for it. Isn't that remarkable? That yeah. A drug that's being widely used, suddenly it gets, you know, on the banned list, and suddenly nobody's using it? Hmm. But maybe they were using it. And maybe, like I say, the NFL used that to manipulate guys into doing things they may not have done. Just simple blackmail. I, or look yeah. pro quo, whichever way you want to look at it. That that's That's true. So, um... I had the uh, the privilege to hang around the Arizona Cardinals for a little bit during their training camp um, about 15 years ago, and come on, s some of these guys were on stuff. It it was it was so obvious, um, but it, it's just like everyone was doing it. I mean, uh, even the, the the kicker. I mean, uh, you know, because that's what I was there for is is for kicking. So uh, it, the okay. kicker they had, Neil Rackers, he was. He was doing something. I just knew. And, um, yeah, it was just something that, that nobody seemed to care about. It was obvious. Um, but, yeah, you're right. All of a sudden, when they, when they started testing for it, it just went out the window. But what, yeah. what about Peyton Manning getting HGH sent to um, his, his, in his wife's his wife. name yeah. and saying that was for having kids? I looked that up. The, his, the twins that he had, the... Um, their, their conception does not um, line up with his story. Now, I just yeah. want to know how he got away with that and, and why nobody looked into this. This is just weird. I mean... Well, once again, the, the journalists didn't do their job. Yeah, yeah. Because it, everybody it, should know he was just coming off that neck surgery that basically should have probably mm -hmm. ended his career. Mm -hmm. And now HGH is showing up at his house and he's back in the NFL and he wins the Super Bowl. And nobody connected the dots to all of that? Really? I mean, come on. I mean, an average person can connect the dots on that sort of thing. But that's, yeah. and then, so here's the thing, too. You even think about it that way. If the NFL let all that go, which I'm sure they did, 
and said, we want, we'd rather have Peyton Manning in the league. We don't care about the HGH and the testing. Sure. In a way, that's another way of manipulating and raking games. Is here's a guy who should be out of the league, and instead he's in the league, playing in the league, using drugs that he's not supposed to be allowed to use, and the NFL is turning a blind eye to it. Well, now again, you're affecting games, right? You're altering the way games are really being played. Oh, yeah. Well, I, not just that. I, th- I think I think tanking for a draft pick, I think that should be so... Uh, that 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 right there is a massive form of uh, of cheating. That tanking oh, yeah. is that's integrity of the game level stuff. That you know they say they care about the integrity of the game. How can you let a team lose on purpose? That is wrong. And you know it, it's just mind boggling that p- not enough fans get pissed off about that. They want that draft pick because they think that draft pick is going to save and change everything. Man, even the fans sometimes don't have any integrity. It, no, you know. People were talking no, about the Patriots exactly tanking. I was against it. I said, no, 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 don't do it. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, that's why I brought that up earlier about the NBA right before my headphones went out. Is, yeah. You know, the, the NBA, I mean, you have Mark Cuban twice publicly, basically, publicly say, I told my teammates in our best interest to lose. But did he lower ticket prices? Did he give refunds to people? Was he giving out free hot dogs or anything at those games? Everything was full price. They were still going out there and playing a basketball game, but he was telling his team, ordering his team to lose. And that's a fixed game. If you have the yeah. owner of the team telling his team to lose and they go out there and lose, that's a fixed game. And that basically proves what I'm saying is why it's perfectly legal for a league to fix its own games. Mark Cuban gave you the proof. Yeah, so you so tanking, the, yeah, tanking is not just bad for the sport. Um, tanking, what I th- people are betting on those games, you know, so yeah, it's, it's fraud. And as far as I'm concerned, um, okay. So we have another question here. Let's see, we have a, another $10 super chat from elf of courage. Uh, this guy's on a roll. He's won our last two quarterback tournaments. We have a contest like you win an Xbox. If you pick the right quarterback every week, um, uh, he's, he's, he's about to possibly go to his third finals here. Uh, Elva yeah. Curry says, what would the NFL have to do to be considered fraudulent? <laughs> That's a good question. That is uh, a good question. I mean, I already can cons- say I'm already considering them fraudulent. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think he means like, what, what, what's it going to take to make everybody like go, hey, down. something's yeah. wrong here. We've got to st- stop this. I think that's what he means. I, so. Again, you'd think it, they, fans would be woken up by now. I mean, you had like that one play, what was it, the uh, Rams-New Orleans, uh, the Saints game, where they had that pass interference call that was super egregious that wasn't oh, yeah. flagged. Yeah. And they had, you know, people are up in arms about that. Mm-hmm. The next week they're watching football, right? <laughs> yeah. Forgotten about. I mean, I know a lot of fans actually in New Orleans stopped watching and they did refuse to watch that Super Bowl over that play because the ratings actually for the Super Bowl tanked yeah. in uh, the New Orleans area for that Super That's Bowl. True. But that was when the Rams wanted, they wanted the Rams to win. So there you go. But I don't know, to be considered fraudulent, I mean, I think it, just watch the game. Just watch the game, especially this weekend. There's going to be six games. You know there's going to be some nonsense in one of those, if not more than one of those games. You just know it. You know a hashtag NFL rigged is going to be you know trending on X again. You I know. know it. I know. And it's always trending. Tune in and watch. Yeah. So, I mean, I, what's going to be considered fraudulent? I don't know what else you can do. I mean, I'd say that's why, I mean, I've written my books, I've put them on my website. That's why I said I've kind of run out of things to say because yeah. I think I've proven my point. It's just whether people want to believe it or not. Well, the thing about your book and, and uh, uh, is, is that you, um, you, 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 you know, you uh, write down the facts, you, you show where you got it from, you did your research, so you're not just spouting like crazy shit. You know, um, yeah. well, and, wh- and that's what kind of drives me a little nuts because I mean, I, I know there's a lot of people on YouTube who do a lot of videos about sports being fixed and games being fixed, and they do it like week after week after week after week, and they're like, Oh, look at this bad call, look at that bad call, look at this, look at that, look at that. Yeah, and so a lot of them steal stuff from me and don't give me credit for it, but a lot of them also kind of they overdo it because, like I said, I don't think every game is fixed. I don't think this happens all the time. I mean, I think bad calls can just naturally occur, but it's when there's bad calls occurring and it's helping a certain team that's helping a certain storyline 
that's when I start questioning it. But they kind of dilute everything, and they make they make people like me look more like crazy conspiracy theorists because they're flooding the market with all this, you know, supposed game fixed sports conspiracy stuff. And it just, like you say, it yeah. doesn't really help the cause. It almost hurts the cause because it's like, you know, every, you know, weird light in the sky is a UFO and it's a space alien. Well, no, it's just, you're not necessarily understanding what you're seeing. And it, it, that kind of bugs me to see that on YouTube where it's like everywhere. And it's like, guys, you got to, you got to slow your roll a little bit on some of this stuff, you know, make some yeah. sense, make some connections and make it lead somewhere. Don't just blurt it out there. Yeah, I feel that way. Um, uh, I feel that way as a Christian when I see other people claim they're a Christian and they're spouting like flat earth stuff and things like that. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> stop it. Yeah. You know, uh, I know. I, yeah, I know. I know. I know what you mean there. Um, so we had a. Uh, we had a guy on um, last year, like last Thanksgiving, I think it was, and um, I'm not I'm not calling him out or anything or making fun of him or nothing like that. He's he he you know he came on the show. He had most people aren't brave enough to, you know, come on a show and it was a debate. Like me and him were deb- not like this. It wasn't an interview. It was a an actual debate. But the things that he was going after, um, and even before the debate started, I even said, I think we agree on the surface that it's you know, the NFL can and has done stuff. But where we fall, fell off and where the debate really, the whole show was debating is that he was really into a bunch of stuff like um, magnets in the goalpost and the, where, the, where the balls would be controlled on a field yeah. goal and, um, and, and stuff like uh, the entire thing is choreographed like a play where all the players at practice are really rehearsing instead of... Um, you know, it was just like really stuff out there that that disqualified and would make you people would lump you into that kind of yeah. thing. Well, I mean, know. like the magnet thing, so. for example, I have a page on my website about the magnet thing. I don't necessarily believe that one, but it's a good conspiracy theory. And I have yeah, it's seen fun. It's it's it's, it's, it's fun, stuff, but it's a fun yeah. one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. the way I kind of more look at it. I mean, yeah. I even tweeted last year during the Super Bowl that I showed. I made a bet because I forgot what website had it. Um, you could bet on whether or not a field goal or an extra point attempt in the Super Bowl would hit the upright or the crossbar. And because I had brought up the magnet thing a few times on my Twitter feed, I was like, I'm betting this. And I showed that I made a bet and I won because I forgot. Yeah. I think it was uh, Elliot. I think he hit. I think he doinked one right off the cross or the upright and it didn't go through. And I won my bet. So, <laughs> but that's again, hilarious. That one I just find is fun. Yeah. Yeah. That that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. But but like um, you know that was all that was really all that was there. He didn't have the research and the and the the backing and you know stuff backing, like that. Yeah. 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 Um. And and so that's I know what you mean. Like it's hard to take one seriously when people are taking it the other way. And again, I'm not knocking Elm or anything like that. It's just, um, no. but. I I get it. I understand, you know, so. Yeah, it's um, one thing to, you know, believe in a conspiracy theory, and it's one thing to repeat it, but it's also one of those things where, you know, you start, if you know, if you believe like in the JFK assassination conspiracy theories, where you just start throwing out like wild accusations against, you know, whoever, you know, supposedly maybe killed JFK, and it's like, where are you getting this from? I mean, it's got to be, and that's why I try with my books and everything, you know, to, like I say, connect all the dots and show you all the evidence and show you the references, where I get this from, where I got that from, and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. to make it as believable and as, you know, interesting as I can and back up at what I'm saying with all this evidence. And, yeah, like I say, to see that stuff just get thrown out there randomly, it's just like, oh, man, you're just, you're not helping my cause, you're making it worse. <laughs> what, what was the What was the one thing, can you remember, was it one thing that changed you from fan to Brian Chewy, the author of the fixes in, you know, type books. Like, what was that? I think there, there was two books that were probably my biggest influence for doing what I did. Um, there's one book called They Call It a Game, which was written by Bernie Parrish, who was a former player for the uh, Cleveland Browns. He was actually on the uh, board for the NFL's Players Association for a very long time, the union, the Players Union. And he wrote a book, and they call it a game, which was written, I think, in the early 70s. He basically wrote that he thought that when 
basically what we talked about with Kennedy when the um, television network started buying into the NFL that they completely changed the game and basically bought the game and owned the game and ran the game. And he never felt NFL football was the same. And he alluded in the book that he thought like Super Bowl three was rigged for television that made sure that the merger became what it was and led to the modern day NFL. And then the other book was this book called uh, Interference by Dan Moldea. I know that one. Had written a lot about, yeah. Yep. And his book was about games being fixed by basically organized crime and gamblers for gambling purposes. And basically, I kind of, those two ideas and those two influences kind of led to the fixes in it. So, so it wasn't, were you, were you, I guess you got those books because you were suspicious or you just happened to be interested in them? I think I was just interested in them if I remember right. But I'd always long, like I have two older brothers and they would bet on football and other sports and stuff. And, you know, you always hear the fixes in because a lot of times you think yeah. as a gambler, oh, I have a winning bet. My team lost. Well, it was fixed. Sure. It's the only way I lost is because the game was mm -hmm. fixed. Absolutely. And, you know, they would kind of say that. But then occasionally my one brother especially would be like, he would say, well, you know, the game was fixed. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? And he's like nine years older than me. And he'd go, well, look, you know, blah, this happened and this happened and this happened. And it all favored this team. And that's the team that won. And it's time to start to get the gears turned into my head. And so I think a combination of being interested in, you know, so-called conspiracy theories like JFK and those other type yeah. of things as it was and interest in sports and it just all blended together. Yeah, exactly. For, for me to believe um, or start looking into a conspiracy theory or give it credibility or actually just kind of look at it in a serious way, I need motive. You know, I need like yeah. why I need benefits, you know, and are the benefits greater than the risks, you know, and then I'll start to look into it. So, for example, you know, there's a, like I already kind of mentioned some conspiracy theories I clearly don't believe in. But then there's other ones like JFK. You know, I, I, I do believe that there was more going on than the official Warren Commission Story. report. Yeah, um, because that one has those elements that I'm looking for, you know. In the same way where I believe, you know, the stuff in your book, obviously that that happened. But I also believe that it's I've always believed that it's possible for those things to happen. I just disagreed with the crazy fringe stuff that was like out there because, you yeah. know, it, it, it just made it made it strange. We uh, we have another uh, super chat here for you. And. Um, uh, oh, wait, wrong one. He's asking that question a lot. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I said you said you just kept doing the same one. I was like, oh, he's really asking. That yeah, question. yeah. He was like, he wants to know. <laughs> he, he didn't like your yeah. first answer. <laughs> no. Um, so Milena sends a twelve dollars super chat. Uh, she always sends a twelve dollars super chat because that's Tom Brady's number. Her, she, you know, she loves Tom Brady. Um, she says she asks Brian. I have to ask this. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the best quarterback of all time, in your opinion? It's not Tom Brady. It's a loaded so question. I can't say how's that if I say no, not Tom Brady. Best <laughs> um, quarterback of all time? Jeez. I mean, I think actually probably, I don't know. It's, I mean, again, for my youth, I mean, I we grew up in the Elway Marino era. And mm -hmm. I, mean, I think what, I mean, actually probably the greatest quarterback of all time is really John Unitas in all honesty, because he did That's, as a quarterback uh, um, what nobody else was doing at that time in that era. And, I mean, I think, you know, I actually think if you put guys like Marino in today's NFL with the way they protect the quarterback and the way they allow – they basically don't allow defensive players almost to guard wide receivers, I think Dan Marino would – he'd put up like 6,000 yards every season. I think he'd be unstoppable because of what he was able to do with the Well, ball. Dan Marino is a freak of nature. Like he he yeah. is uh, one of a kind in, in that. And, and I agree, absolutely agree, yeah. Um, Johnny Knights, I mean, I I, 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 that's interesting. I like that pick. I mean, I don't agree, but I mean, uh, but Johnny is up there, ve very high up there. But I'm gl it's a refreshing pick as far as I'm concerned. It's always Tom or Joe, you know, that's-, that's Joe. Oh, Montana? Uh, yeah, like no, but, Flacco. Yeah. Flacco. Come on. <laughs> Joe he, Flacco. He's going to take the Browns to the Super Bowl, baby. 
It's, 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 it's uh, going to be Cleveland versus Detroit, and Joe Flacco is going to raise the Lombardi, and he's going to go to the Hall of Fame, and it's going to be all glorious and everything. There's a storyline for you right there. Well, that would be, actually. I mean, that would be if Cleveland played Detroit in the Super Bowl, that would be like when the Indians played the Cubs in the World Series. It'd be like two long-suffering you know, fan bases. One of them is finally going to get their day of glory, and one's going to go back to still being a long-suffering you know, franchise. But, yeah, it would be almost like the same storyline. Well, it's, it's shocking that neither team has even played in a Super Bowl. And that that's yeah. what's mind boggling, honestly, because they, they they're, you know, they're two of the old one, two of the oldest. I know Detroit is one of the oldest uh, mm-hmm. and yeah. um, they go back to the 20s. Cleveland. Yeah. So it's just it's just you would think that they would have uh, much more stability uh, than that. But um, OK, so well, before I know, let you, oh, go things, ahead, go ahead. I'll just just bring up quick. Is, you know, it's, you know, they, because people will tell me, well, if things are fixed, why haven't the Lions ever won? Or why haven't the Browns ever won? And I think it does, it still does come down to talent. Because, you know, you can't fake the talent like LeBron James has. You can't fake the talent, you know, Tom Brady has. You can't fake certain things. Right. You have to have that. And so you can't just say, well, we're going to have the Browns win this year and have them have, you know, Johnny Manziel as their quarterback. Because he wasn't that talented. You can't, you know, <laughs> if you faked it that much, it would be blatantly obviously that you're pushing this team to the Super Bowl. So I think that's part of the reason why the Lions did have Stafford, but he wasn't really, he, like you say, it wasn't until he got traded that they all thought, oh my God, Matt Stafford's the greatest quarterback ever. But yeah. you had to, ha- you have to have that talent there. And then if you have the talent, then if you protect the talent or give the talent a little help, then they can overachieve potentially more than they should naturally. But I think that's part of it is, yeah, you can have a high draft pick. You can try to get this guy, and he just doesn't pan out. He can be a Killy Smith or he can be, you know, whoever, some lousy quarterback if you have the wrong guy. Yeah. But if you're the right guy and he starts getting traction like a C.J. Stroud, then maybe the NFL says, hey, you know what, we'll give you a little help. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, I can't find it, but I remember someone asked the question. It went by really fast. Um, their question was a good question, I think. Uh, if someone was to start reading your books, what is the, what is the, what is the best one to intro somebody in uh, of the four that you've written? What's the first one they should get that, that really opens the door for them? Well, probably the original one, the original The Fix is In. The Fix is In, um, okay. Yeah, I mean, you could, the, actually, I mean, you could potentially do the, the sequel, if you will, The Fix is Still In, mm-hmm. because the first chapter of The Fix is Still In is kind of almost a recap of the original book and it kind of boils everything down into one chapter and then goes from there and it's more more recent things because obviously six is in came out in 2010 it ends in 2010 that's as far as i could go whereas the fix is still in came out in 2019 so there's you know the 10 year span in between that i kind of catch people up on things that happen um so either one of those two but probably the original would be the best okay well before i let you go um i have a personal question i want to ask you uh i mean not a personal question about your personal life but i mean from me is what i meant oh what's your social security number brian could you tell you no um (laughs) tell me in the uh, in the 21st century what is the most ridiculous fixed super bowl in your opinion other than the two we talked about the last two years. Which one? So from 2000 to 2020, what is... The most blatant? Basically? Yeah, what, which one do you think is the most... It, it's like the NFL's version of the the Lakers-Kings final, or uh, semifinals thing, or Western Conference final, like that type of thing. Well, the one that, the one that jumps in my head first is when Peyton Manning won. The first one or second and- one? The one, uh, I, I take that back. Well, yeah, Super Bowl 50. Oh, the, with the Broncos, so the he, okay. Yeah, because that one, again, he probably shouldn't have been in the league. He could, I mean, his passes were terrible. And I think really, I honestly think what happened was, I think he tanked. I I think Peyton Manning is what they would call a company guy. And then he would do what the NFL wanted him to do. And I think he tanked the Super Bowl against the New Orleans Saints. Because, I mean, he had a 
plenty of connection. His dad was the Saints quarterback for a long time. He grew up in that area. The Saints were that big story after Hurricane Katrina. And I kind of think their whole Super Bowl was rigged. Their whole run was rigged. And I think Manning tanked that game, especially if you look at that game-winning interception that he literally threw right to a third Porter, yeah. who it was, who ran it back if we're, for a touchdown. And then I think they rewarded him with Super Bowl 50 because it was like his swong song, you know, that they were sending him out. Super Bowl 50, Peyton Manning's one of the greatest guys we've ever had, and they were going to send him out, you know, the sheriff on his horse, you know, out into yeah. the sunset. And I think that whole, I, to me, it was like as soon as that Super Bowl was set up, I was like, there's no way Peyton Manning doesn't win this game. There's no way they send him home a loser today. And so in my mind, that one's probably, like, say both of those. But I think that one was the one that was just like, like you said, it was like there's no way the Rams could lose to the Bengals that game. I felt there was no way Peyton Manning didn't come home a winner that game. Yeah. And not and because well, of talent. What do, you, what do you think about Cam not jumping on that fumble? Well, that's one of the things. And then he didn't even answer exactly afterwards. Mm-hmm. He had that kind of non-answer. And if I remember right, he left the uh, yeah the, he, uh, he took off call press yeah. conference like right after. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was very suspect. I mean, it, you think you wouldn't just stand there and look at the football on the ground, right? You, no, your instinct no, would be to jump no, on no, no. He you, just stood there and looked at it on the ground. It was like, mm, there it is. Just your instinct. So, yeah. Your your um, uh, football. Even as as children, yeah. when we when we were in Pee Wee and Pop Warner and stuff, your instinct. You see a a ball. I mean, hell, to this day, someone someone drops a piece of trash and I yell fumble like an idiot. You know, <laughs> it's it's just like. Yeah. It's in our DNA. If you're an American kid, you you see a ball, get on it. it I don't care yeah. if it's a basketball, a football, does, whatever. You go, you know. Well, look to, at the guys to, even, to stop to, in a know, Super Bowl. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, and you look at guys. I say, you know, throws an incomplete pass, and the guy will scramble and pick it up and act like it's a fumble. You, you know, got to play it's like that. Yeah. A forward pass, you know. But in this case, yeah, Newton just looked at it like. He was directed like today ain't your day, Cam. I've I've always wondered about that, and and uh, you know I've tried to reason with it. Like, was it that? Was it like rigged, or was he a coward, or like like what what was he thinking? I was always trying to just like what was that, and yeah, you know I we'll never get a a, a definitive answer, obviously. Um, no. But um, I I honestly I thought you were gonna. I was guessing in my head what you might pick. That's a good one. I wasn't even thinking about that one. I was I was going to say that you were probably going to pick Pittsburgh versus Seattle. Oh, well, that one's, yeah. That one's, but, that, well, that the one. Referee apologized. He the apologized. Was yeah, yeah. Later for all the bad calls yeah. against him. Yeah, that one's a little shady. Yeah. I, I just remember that one. I that mean, there's was, been a lot. That, I mean, I don't, yeah. know if, I don't know if it was in 2000 yet, but the the one that the Raiders rigged, and lost against the uh, Buccaneers. That was 02. What year was it? Yeah, okay. That one it was equally as bad because it's clearly that they're, I mean, you had Jerry Rice and Tim Brown, two all fame wide receivers, basically tell the press that our, you know, coach sabotaged that game. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a pretty big you're, Well, you're, you're, you're playing, again, you're playing, kind of you're playing against John Gruden and you don't even change anything. Uh, yeah, that was. That, that makes no sense. Be. Yeah, that makes no sense. Um, okay, so uh, one last thing I'm going to do to you, and uh, don't hate me for this, but I- I've got to. That's fine. Give me some predictions. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm not holding it to you or anything like that. I just want to know what you – because in the past when I was on your website, um, I remember you would, you would do pretty well with, like, kind of knowing where the kind of the story was going. So – um yeah. what's your i i kind of think i don't know if they'll win it but i kind of think the frisco is going to make the super bowl for sure okay because i think they're making i think brock purdy is a tom brady 2.0 um you know he's mr irrelevant yeah he's seems like a clean cut all-american type of kid and i think i think he's a story that the nfl can definitely get behind and push and I mean, their team seems good, and you got the coach Shanahan and all that. And I mean, I think, I think, yeah, I think they're going to make it out of the NFC for sure. The AFC, I could see it going a lot of different ways. I mean, I could see him using Lamar Jackson. I could still use him 
see them using the Bills because the Bills still got that whole thing with their stadium still going on. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. That one would be harder to tell. But it would be hard to have them have number one versus number one again, you know, in terms of rank the seeds. Frisco against Baltimore. Although there's that whole conspiracy theory about the colors. You've seen that about the uh, logo? Yeah. For the past couple of years. (laughs) This year, it definitely definitely does look like San Francisco and Baltimore's colors. Definitely purple in there, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, it's not it's, Las Vegas. It's, it's pretty. It's pretty funny. You know? I don't. I. I wonder who caught that. I like, but it, it is funny. I. I remember a, a really good one was um, in 2020 when uh, Tom Brady moved to Tampa Bay. The COVID molecule is that pewter color, and the gray, the gray, uh, orange, and 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 oh, and red yeah, yeah, yeah. of the Bucks. That that's the COVID molecule, uh, or molecule, or whatever you want to call it. The COVID, uh, the animation that they were always sh- the government was there always go, sharing, yeah. was the exact color scheme of the Bucks. I remember I thought that was hilarious. And then, the next year, let's see, the Rams won, and it was the same exact colors as the Ukrainian flag, which is Vladimir Putin invaded that year. Yeah. So um, yeah, man, people are uh, are creative with that stuff. It's uh. It's funny how well, they. Well, I always thought too is you know I predicted the the last Buccaneer Super Bowl because I said with really? the COVID everybody was forced to stay home, no teams ever played a home field Super Bowl. I said, wouldn't it be just a weird coincidence that the year everybody had to stay home, the Buccaneers got to play the first ever home Super Bowl, which is exactly what happened. It was a real kind of you know serendipity thing again that coincidence for the NFL, but made for an interesting story yeah well you know like we were saying anything works out i mean they can make something make something happen there you said there was a fourth one you couldn't remember if i give you the matchups would would that uh you said there was a fourth coincidence this weekend uh oh yeah um um, browns texans and you already mentioned that one dolphins chiefs that's the tyree kill um then there's steelers bills wasn't that one? Is there a connection? Packers, Cowboys. You, that's the coach. That's the Mike McCarthy game. Rams, Lions is the oh, Jared Goff Stafford versus game. Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford, the trade game. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the Eagles, Buccaneers is kind of irrelevant. Yeah. It's a football game. <laughs> yeah. In a, NFL, in a, in our NFC South is is trash, and somebody had to go, right? Um, yeah. Exactly. Well, well, this has been uh, very interesting. I, I can't say I agree with every single thing or I have like a different, you know, opinion or whatever, but um, well, you don't about have, nobody some, some of the stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't ask anybody to agree with everything. It's exactly, just, exactly. It, my whole point is trying to get fans to change their mindset, to take sure. their fan hat off and look at these games in a different light. And I think once you do that, I mean, a lot of fans already, I think, have it in their brain because they've seen enough bad calls where they're going, what's going on? But that's the idea is just change your mindset look at this as a business think about what a real business would do in these situations and then come to your own conclusions yeah that makes sense so um thank you for coming on man i really appreciate it this has been no uh, i appreciate having th- me yeah this has been awesome so i really enjoyed it um and love to have you back on if you got a new book coming out or something let, let us know and uh we'll do it again can do all right Sounds thank great. you so much brian have a Thanks, good night. Thanks, you have a Bye. good night. All right, guys. Um, so let's see here. Uh, oh, I know who that is. I know who that is that wrote that. You, you don't have to hide it. No? I know him. That's, uh, that's Muggins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can let that go. Yeah, it's fine. You thought it was just a troll, right? Or something? Yeah, yeah, okay. No. No, I know him. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, I wanted to get that done because, you know, we were having some questions and things like that. And this guy has a lot of information that he's researched it a lot, a lot more than I ever have or ever desired to, really. But um, all in all, I think it was uh, pretty interesting. And it's kind of what I thought, you know. Um, is it possible? Yes. Is it, uh, are they, um, have they done it in the past? Yeah, well, we have evidence of that, but how long, is it, how long has it been? 
and stuff like that, that's, uh, that's up for debate. Because um, like you said, the FBI stopped investigating anything or wasn't even paying attention to anything for the last several decades. So we don't know yes or no, if it is, what the deal is and all that. But um, yeah, so that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, if you are uh, wanting to read more in, about this and uh, investigate more, uh, like I said, the website is thefixesin.net. And uh, he has four books out. They're all available on Amazon. And the uh, first one he wrote is The Fixes In. The last one he wrote, uh, the most recent one, 2019, is The Fix Is Still In. Um, so if you're interested in that, make sure to go there. And you can also follow his website at thefixesin.net where he talks about games every week. Um, so you can do that. Um, OK, so now. Bill Belichick is out as a New England Patriots head coach and GM. So this is exactly what I thought was going to happen. Um, doesn't make me Nostradamus or anything like that. I'm just, I'm just saying that, that uh, I think we all kind of knew it was coming. Um, uh, but as I suspected, Belichick was very happy to be leaving. You could see that in his press conference. And I don't mean that in a way that he hates New England or anything like that. I just think that he was ready to move on. I think it was one of these things that it's just the time is up. And when I said I wanted uh, Belichick to, to leave, it doesn't mean that I think the next guy is going to be better, okay? You guys know I'm not one of those people. I'm not one of those people that think, oh, the backup quarterback is always better. You know, the backup quarterback syndrome. It's like, oh, the backup quarterback's better, or the next coach is better, or the draft pick that we're getting next year is better. Okay? I don't, that's not my point. My point is difference, change. It's stale. Belichick ran stale. And to be honest with you, every single season that gets worse and worse, I keep thinking about Tom Brady being you know, not being really welcome there anymore and Tom feeling like he needed to go and, and get out of there, that bothers me. And, you know, Belichick's lack of accountability for himself has really, really ran stale. It really bugged me. Um, do I think Belichick is still a good coach? Yeah, I think he can still coach. But he's going to have to do something like Mike McCarthy did. Mike McCarthy took a year off after he was fired from the Packers. And I'm not saying that Mike did anything change, but he did spend a year working on trying to catch up and working on trying to figure out what was happening in the NFL and stuff like that. And, you know, at least he took that time to do that and he kind of realized he had to change. Because you guys remember, Mike McCarthy was very conservative, very... Uh, uh, he was just very bland, and Aaron Rodgers had a problem with that. And then he, he takes a year off, then he comes to Dallas, and now they're, they're doing pretty good. And, um, and, and we'll see what happens with them. But the point is, is that you've got to change. And Belichick, it didn't seem like Belichick was doing anything to change. He wasn't really moving anything forward. He was doing some really stupid shit, almost like you, he wanted to be fired because he, he hired Matt Patricia as offensive coordinator. I mean, why in the would you do that? Why? Why in your right mind would you do something like that? That's got to be the dumbest, like, most ridiculous thing ever. And it just completely just ruined Mac Jones. And, and mentally, I don't know if he's ever going to recover from that. But I, I, I think it's, it's a separation that had to happen. Um, where's Bill going to go? My guess, like I said, I've been telling you guys all year, I think he's going to be uh, here in L.A. with the Chargers. I've seen other people talk about Atlanta or the Washington masturbators, um, whatever. I mean, I, I can't picture him in Washington. I think that's weird. I think that's a, that would be a strange thing. Um, why would he want to do that? Uh, Atlanta's kind of strange. I can't picture Belichick wanting to move to Atlanta, Georgia and coach the Falcons. Although I know Arthur Blank is going to write a blank check probably. Uh, for Belichick to try to get him there, but I think Bill is going to go for his best chances because he destroyed the, the roster in New England. This is what's funny, guys. This is what is so weird about Patriots fans that I've seen, especially on X. They say 
that, well, Belichick's roster is bad. They actually say this. Belichick's roster is bad. He needs to go somewhere like Tom Brady where the roster is good. Belichick was the roster guy. It's, it's, uh, he's the one that did that. He, so the argument doesn't work for him. If he was just the head coach and not the GM, then that argument works, right? It's like if you got a GM that's, that's uh, picking players and, and going over your head and, and doing things you don't approve of, I get it. Then it makes sense. But when you're the guy that's in charge of the entire organization and you've created a roster and a, and a, and a group of coaches that are just completely just ass that they totally suck, you can't really say that. So now Bill is going to have to go to a team where they've already got a good roster so he can either go there and benefit from that roster or he can go there and destroy it. It, it depends on what your, um, what your viewpoint is. Or the new team that they hire, maybe they don't give him the GM duties. Who knows? I don't know. A lot of that's up uh, for debate. I, we, I don't think we have any idea what, they're gonna, what these teams are going to do. But we know for sure he's going to play because Robert Kraft mentioned that in the press conference. Um, so any, any speculation about Bill retiring not going to happen because Kraft said, uh, I'm going to um, be rooting for Bill, except when he's against us on the other sideline. So Bill clearly told uh, Robert that he's going to keep coaching. But it's going to be the Chargers, in my opinion. And, um, and he's going to benefit from a roster that someone else um, put together because he can't, he can't draft offense. So as long as he doesn't mess with that, um, the Chargers could be okay if he could put a good defense around him. We'll see what happens, but whatever. Uh, but we knew it was coming. Uh, Pete Carroll is out in Seattle. He um, is now in an advisory role of some sort, which really means we love you, Pete. We don't really want you to coach anymore. We don't love you that much. Um, but we still want you around because uh, we like you as a motivator and stuff, but we think uh, you can't coach anymore. That's basically what that means. Um, Nick Saban retired from Alabama, which uh, – yeah, I don't really care. Honestly, it's a, as far as I'm concerned, Nick Saban is a guy who couldn't make it in the NFL. So um, it, it's, it's cool. Yeah, I know I, people say he's the GOAT or whatever of college football, but that's like saying you're the GOAT of the WNBA or something. I, don't know. I just don't give a shit. Okay, whatever. Um, so, But that is news. That's there. So, Okay. So now we have got um, two, uh, two games left in the quarterback contest, and we're going to get that stat real quick for you guys. And then after that, we're going to talk about uh, the matchups for the playoffs this weekend and uh, any, anything else you guys uh, want to mention real quick uh, after that. So... Um, oh, we got a super chat. Elf of Courage sends a $10 super chat. He says, uh, didn't think of this until now, but could first round bias be a reason for rigging games? You mean, yeah, to, 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 to push that first rounder and stuff like that? I doubt it because um, we wouldn't have so many busts. Uh, I, I think, I, I think, um, I think if, if rigging takes place, I think it's either... Maybe rigging is the wrong word. Rigging implies that it's, it's all scripted and ahead of time. Um, if it is, like if something like that goes on, you, first of all, you can't insulate yourself from someone going rogue. You can't stop that. Uh, my suspicion with L.A. And, and New Orleans that Brian had brought up, I think there was a guy, um, the side judge, who was right there, who, whose job it was to call pass interference, didn't call it. Come to find out he's from L.A. and he had a connection to the Rams. It was like a very weird background. He might have done that call on his own. The, the problem is, is, is the lack of scrutiny after that and not being able to hold him accountable for that publicly. Um, as where you could do that with a UFC ref or a boxing ref or somebody like that, where we know who they are and you, the players can talk about them and, and stuff. So, so that's one form of it. I, I think um, it would be 
It'd be ignorant to think that you, could, you can't insulate yourself. You cannot keep that from happening. Somebody can go rogue, like the Brian Donahue guy, the NBA guy. You, nothing you can do about that. Um, as far as players being involved, I don't believe players are involved. Uh, I know they were back in the old days when they weren't making any money. But the amount of money these guys make, getting caught doing that, there's, it would, it, they, would be, they would be ruined. I don't think it's worth it for them. Um, I think with coaches, I think tanking is a form of rigging. So there you go. You know, that's a, that's a form to get a, to get a better draft pick or whatever. Um, I think they should come down hard on them a lot more than that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so uh, there, there's, there's several ways right there that you could do it, and you don't necessarily have to, it has to be scripted or, or like Brian even said, uh, we, I think we agree on that. It's not that the NFL is sitting there writing a script like who's going to win this year and all that. And you still need to be a good player. You still need to be talented and all that. But, uh, but uh, yeah, you can't, you can't stop a lot of that stuff. There's nothing you can do. Um, okay. Let's see here. This won't take long, guys. Um, we only got two matchups here. So, um, okay. Whoa, way too big. <laughs> That's what she said. Okay. All right, so first, uh, first of two games, we've got uh, Tyree Vaughn uh, versus Justin Shetlett. And we're going to roll here. Oh, hear my voice crack. Okay, so that's TDR for you guys. So uh, um, Tyree, you're first. You've got about, um, about a minute to pick. I'm going to give you more than 30 seconds this time since it's the, the playoffs, but uh, you need to pick... Uh, which quarterback you think is going to have the best touchdown to turnover ratio? And on deck, we have on the other side, we've got Elf of Courage versus Nightwalker. And your stat is TDR. Same thing. So, Elf of Courage and Nightwalker, be thinking about um, your guys. Uh, and uh, have them ready for me if you can when I come back to you. So, okay. Tyree, what do you got for me? Mahomes. All righty. Okay, Justin. What do you got for me, man? Lamar Jackson, oh, that won't work, Justin. He's, uh, he's on by. Although that would be a great pick next week. <laughs> I'll be right back, guys, while you're thinking, Justin. Yes, Stroud is back. You want Stroud?
Good pick. I like it. Okay. Tyree Vaughn, you got Mahomes. Justin, uh, you've got Stroud, and uh, your stat is turnover or touchdown to turnover ratio. And that leaves us with Elf of Courage. Um, who you got? And Nightwalker. Is Nightwalker here? Have you guys seen him? Elf of Courage is going with Deck Prescott. Okay. I haven't... I don't think Nightwalker's here. Nightwalker, what you doing, man? Oh, wait, he is here. He is here. Or maybe he's not here anymore. Well, I'm going to go ahead and roll for him. and uh, if, But if he comes in and makes his pick, and of course I'll change it. He was here, yeah. Yeah, I found his name on the on the list a while ago. Okay. Well, that's a good pick anyway, Tua. So mm. okay. Alright guys, so there you have it. There's the uh uh the semifinals uh, for this quarterback contest. Up of Courage has got Dak, uh, Nightwalker's Tua, Tyrese Mahomes, and Justin's got Stroud, and both uh, matchups are TDR. There you go. Good luck, guys, and uh, we'll see what happens. Okay. So let's take a look at the uh, matchups for this weekend. So we've got the fifth seed, Browns, uh, versus the fourth seed, Texans. This is a case where you've got a um, Texans team that won their division. It's one of those where they won their division, yeah, they've got a home game, yeah, but the actual visiting team is a better team. Uh, because they came from a division with two great teams, uh, I think I think the Browns win this. I, 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 it's not wishful thinking. This is me picking with my brain. Uh, of course, I hope they. Uh, I, I hope I'm hoping that the the uh, Browns win, uh, but uh, I do believe that they're going to win. Um, what do you got, Mugs? Muggs has got him. Uh, Browns twenty-seven, Texas twenty-three. That's a, I like that. Um, nothing, nothing would be funnier than for Joe Flacco to win the Super Bowl for the Browns. That would be the craziest shit of all time. That would be just so fun and so ridiculous, right? Um, so going Cleveland there, and I want Addy to be happy. You know, I want Addy to to call in and be all excited and and uh, and good for him. You know, so. Now, now, Browns winning would be uh, would be proof of uh, miracles. Okay, 
Um, Brady coming back? Uh, yeah, well, if Brady comes back, I'm, I'm just saying if Brady did come back. I'm not, I don't know if he's coming back. But I'm, I'm just saying, though, if he did, let's say if he did, he's going to be a Denver Bronco. That's, that's what would happen if he came back. Um, okay, we got Dolphins at Chiefs. We all know what's going to happen here. The Dolphins cannot compete. They, uh, they're pretenders. They, uh, they have less wins against 500 teams than over 500 teams than the, the Patriots do. It, okay, wrap your brain around that. Um, they're, they're pretenders. They're, they're fake. Okay. Um, and of course they lost the division right at the last minute. Um, so a division that a few weeks back looked like they had sewn up and should have been theirs. But they are going to lose um, this one. Uh, the Chiefs are going to get by with a win on this one. And, they're, and if the Dolphins keep it close, that's when they're really going to get screwed. Uh, we'll see some funny stuff happening here. Now, don't forget, I've made my prediction that the Chiefs will not lose a close game in the playoffs if they do lose it's it's going to be because they got blown out um but if they're in a close game they will not lose a close game there will be something that uh helps them but the miami dolphins are not going to go from miami florida to kansas city uh right now and defeat them it's not going to happen uh although that would be uh that'd be interesting uh to see the dolphins uh do that but not going to happen so kansas city's right there Okay, those games are Saturday's games. Um, Sunday, uh, we've got the Steelers and Bills. Uh, Steelers are a team that just should be thinking their lucky stars are even in the playoffs. It's a joke. The seventh seed is a pathetic joke. Um, and they're going to get completely uh, gang-raped by the Buffalo Bills. So not much to say about that one. Uh, that that's just too easy okay uh, uh later on that day we've got another shitty participation trophy seventh seed the packers who's going to just get ass stomped by the dallas cowboys um that's why Dak was a was a good pick there uh looks like uh, muggins has got bills 30 steelers 17 um it could be even worse than that I think actually, I think I think I think you could go more like you know, 35, uh, 35, uh, 14. You you could if you wanted to. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be shocked by that. Um, Cowboys forty one, Packers thirteen. I actually like that score. I, I like that score. Yeah, I, it's going to be a complete just annihilation. It's going to be an absolute annihilation. Um, that one's done. It's this seven seed bullshit, man. It's ri ridiculous. Uh, Cowboys should be on a buy right now. This is uh, the Bills should be on a buy. The, this whole thing is just nonsense. This seven seed stuff. Okay. Um, after that, we've got the Rams and Lions. This one I'm very interested in, uh, but I think the Lions pull it off. I really do. It's not just because I'm pulling for them or I'm a big fan of Amon Ross St. Brown, which you guys know, and he did a. A, a thing in the intro of the show for us um but i just like what the lions are all about um they should have won you know that game against dallas the point the reason i'm mentioning it is if their coach would have actually kicked the extra point after three tries what an idiot but uh regardless of the the uh the situation with the ref and all that but that, what, I, that, what that proves is that the Lions are good and they're playing well because they almost beat Dallas, who's the number two seed. And they, 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 they really could have taken that if they had just been smart. But they're good enough. That good enough is definitely enough to beat the Rams. Okay, The Rams are nothing special. Um, there's nothing there that Matthew Stafford knows about the Lions and there's nothing that um, is going to benefit the Rams from having Matthew Stafford. It, none of that's going to happen. The Lions are a different team now, and um, Goff, maybe maybe McVay knows something about Goff, but uh, Goff has changed as well, and they can run the ball uh, if they need to. The Lions got this. So um, 
but this one this one won't be uh, uh, like a crazy blowout or anything like that this one will be a good one um, let's see uh, Muggins has got Lions 23 Rams 20 and overtime hmm yeah I like that interesting and then uh, you've got on Monday uh, which is strange um, Eagles fifth seed Eagles uh, which who blew the NFC East uh, in spectacularly ridiculous fashion um, and they're going against the Buccaneers and I think Buccaneers is a Texan situation where you default you're the default winner of an absolutely shitty uh, division um, Eagles are going to get it together I know that they're struggling and all that stuff but we're we're, they're struggling compared to where we think they should be, which is what we thought they should be is the number one seed and dominating everybody and being 14 and two or 14 and three or some shit like that, right? Um, I still, that doesn't mean they're not good enough to beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, okay? Come on, let's, let's not get crazy. Um, Eagles are going to walk all over Tampa Bay. It's done. Just book it. Uh, you can do whatever you want, so. Um, Oh, uh, Zippy. Zippy has Bucks 26, Eagles 21. So this is uh, one where we uh, uh, disagree on. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the Eagles are still, they still got it. And I also think that there's something that happens to you when you lose the Super Bowl. It's like, because everything that it takes to get to a Super Bowl it's so difficult and you lose a close game like that especially when one is kind of taken from you but to, and then you think oh my god next year we got to do it all over again got to win all these games and get back they're just trying to get back to the super bowl and the the regular season starts to become i don't want to say boring but it's just not your focus you're not and the eagles are not like the old patriots where Every week, they can just compartmentalize uh, the schedule, and just that week matters. They're not that type. So I think that has something to do with their sloppiness. They're also got some injuries and things like that. But I think overall, I think the mentality part is the problem. But I, I think now that they're in the playoffs, they'll, they'll be able to uh, uh, switch gears enough to beat Tampa Bay. Now, after that, um, we'll have to see who they're playing. But... That I'm only speaking to now. I'm only speaking to this weekend uh, against the Bucks. So that's that's where I'm at with them. All right. Now I'm thinking about broad, uh, doing some broadcasts for some of these games, um, just because I think it'd be fun. Uh, we'll see. Um, there's a few here that I, that I'm interested in broadcasting. I think um, I think it would be fun to do the Browns. I think uh, it would be fun to do the Dolphins, Chiefs, Steelers, Bills, no, Packers, Cowboys. Well, the Cowboys interest me as a team, but that's just going to be a blowout, and we're just going to be sitting here after the first quarter. It's going to be you know 21 nothing, and we're just going to be like ugh, you know. But um, yeah, all right, we'll see. We'll see what happens. The Sunday night game, Rams and Lions, I'm very interested in. I wish it was here in L.A. That would be, you know, the other way around, but that would be cool to go see the Lions. We could go see Jared Goff, you know, and Amon Ross St. Brown play, but it's in Detroit. All right. <laughs> Elf Courage says, we all know you want to broadcast Browns games. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been, I've been, what, is it that obvious? Really? Huh. Maybe I've been mentioning it too much. Um, I can't help myself. I can't help myself. I, I just want to see it. It's, it's ridiculous. So, yeah. I'm surprised no one sent uh, 
Um, Oh, wait a minute. Oh, here's one. I was going to say a, a Patreon super chat. P, P, you know, you get one, you get a super chat with your uh, paid account on Patreon and nobody used it. I was just, I mean, I saw a lot of people here tonight. But here's one. Why am I just getting it now, though? It's 30 minutes later. That's weird. It just popped up. Okay, thanks Patreon, maybe next time. Uh, just tell me that, yeah, just send it in the regular thing, say you want to super chat and, um, and do it in the thing, because I know if you've got a wrench, it, it means that you're on Patreon anyway, so. Um, okay, so we have a Patreon super chat from Jalen. says, question for Aaron. If the Rams beat the Lions, um, were you wrong? The Rams made the wrong choice in terms of what they did to Jared Goff. Matt seems better, and the Rams made the playoffs. Why rebuilding? If the Rams beat the Lions, was I wrong? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know how that would, how that would work because uh, I never said they were wrong. Right now, they clearly are not wrong. They won the Super Bowl. Uh, the point was. If, the, if Jared wins with the Lions and both teams have a Super Bowl, then I would say that Jared won that because the Lions are on the up. The Rams are kind of, you know, yeah, they got, they, they got in the playoffs. They kind of just, you know. Um, but if, if the Lions beat them and then the Lions go on to win the Super Bowl, then I would say that Jared won that. Um, won that deal probably because the lines are going to be on an upward trajectory now. Um, but as of right now, uh, it wouldn't change anything. Of course, uh, as of right now, um, the Rams and Stafford won that deal, clearly. So they've got the Super Bowl and the Lions don't. So it wouldn't change anything. So there you go. Ace says, Jared Goff played great this season. He gets snubbed from the Pro Bowl, but Matt Stat Padford, I like to call him Matt Staff Infection, makes the Pro Bowl. What a fucking joke. These Pro Bowl voters are fucking retarded. Yeah, well, it's a popularity contest, and Jared Goff um, doesn't get any traction. You know, it's uh, nobody res has any respect for him, really, and, and um, they think of him the way... Uh, McVay does, you know, just just tr trash them, send them out the door, basically. So, looks like Alpha Courage sent me a super chat. Uh, Elva Courage, uh, Elva Courage sends a $10 super chat on Rumble. He says, if I win this third tournament, can I get uh, a Switch uh, instead of an Xbox? Um, uh, yeah, the Nintendo Switch. Yeah, we'll take a look and see. Um, as long as it's still, is it, is it the same price range? I mean, it's not like the PlayStation or anything. It's not like 500 bucks or something, right? So, um, But yeah, I mean, as, as, as long as it's in the same, the same, you know, I'll order whatever you want me to. Because yeah, I mean, you don't need a third Xbox, right? So, um, but win it first, buddy. Win it. You, got, you, guys, you guys hear the, the shit talking Elf Courage is blasting at you right now. <laughs> All right. Yeah, 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 man. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get that worked out. Um, Elva Courage says, how about a Dallas-Baltimore Super Bowl um, for a black-on-black -black quarterback woke matchup? Well, that wouldn't be very woke. Well, <laughs> Dak is, uh, is uh, half-white, isn't he? So that might disqualify him. I don't know. 
So, yeah, no, it's only woke if uh, it's only woke if they didn't earn their job, right? Um, if they were if they were put there just because of that. Um, but I think everyone agrees that Lamar Jackson and Dak Prescott deserve um, their position, right? So there you go. And uh, going back to the Pro Bowl stuff, you know, what I was saying earlier is um, it, it's not the same as MVP and um, Hall of Fame and stuff like that. So it's um, it, the players vote for Pro Bowl, the fans vote, they, you know, and there's like a percentage of different, you know, like the fans get is a, makes up a percentage and the players and the coaches and stuff. It's, it's a popularity contest, really. It's all about, you know, who gets the most traction and, and all that hype and shit like that. And they start the Pro Bowl voting way too early. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous how early it is. The Pro Bowls are basically pointless. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't list Pro Bowls. Um, anymore when I'm talking about career stats. I don't even bother to, to, to write them down. They're, they, they don't matter. They don't matter. It's just who gives a shit at this point. So Tyree Vaughn is, says, I'm 100% motivated, baby. Yep, I know. Tyree's coming for you, Elf. Watch out. Let's see what Justin has to say. And Nightwalker, I don't know. I don't know. Hey, I think he's just letting the dice decide for him. It, he, you know, it's been working for him, so we'll see how far it goes. Can't fault it if, uh, if it keeps working, right? So. Bitcoin Motorist keeps uh, uh, posting on on Twitter about um, filters regarding Bitcoin. I need to find out what he's talking about. Apparently it's like a big deal right now, like something's going on because, yeah. Elway, why is Elway trending? Ah. Oh, okay. On this day, January 11th, 1987, the drive took place. Nice. Right before the Browns have a playoff game. Yeah, that's something to be trending for them, huh? Belichick, Belichick is trending. What? Hmm. Yeah, it's like mixed uh, reactions, you know, it's, it's, it's like half people, you know, um, you know, being respectful and, and all that stuff, uh, but also, you know, giving their opinion about how they feel about Belichick. And then the other half is um, uh, Patriots fans who are bitching at everybody who has an opinion uh, that is not um, worshiping Belichick uh, completely. So, it's kind of, kind of where that is. Um, okay. Um, I guess that's it. I guess um, we covered everything tonight. Uh, so thank you guys for being here tonight. Thank you to Brian again for, uh, for coming on and um, letting us ask him some questions. I thought that was... Uh, uh, really cool. I think some cool video clips will come come from that. Um, also, I want to let you guys know I am on chess.com. So if you guys like to play chess and want to play me, um, uh, friend me on there. You can just I'm just go by Von Allen. So it's I'm easy to find. Uh, if you guys are interested in stuff like that, and uh, we'll we'll uh, talk this weekend in some form or another, and uh, hopefully it'll be a good good weekend of football and you guys uh you guys have a good weekend okay let's see here 
Is that it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good night, guys. Von Allen Sports. Fuck you. I'm subscribing. This is the man with the most badass name in sports, the Pharaoh, the Egyptian God himself, Amon Ra St. Brown. And on behalf of my man, Vaughn Allen, we want to thank you for your support. Let's fucking go. If you're not watching Vaughn Allen sports, fuck you.